Hello, welcome back to our study in Luke. Um, we're going to be in chapter 18. We're going to uh, do verses, look at verses 9 through 17 today. So grab your Bible or your device. Be finding that while you uh, uh, listen closely to these uh, announcements. Uh, Sunday school has started back. Um, we are uh, wearing masks in all of our classes in Sunday school just to be on the safe side with the coronavirus still being here. Um, uh, we, we don't want to take any chances, so we are still masked in Sunday school. Um, you can do it, trust me. We did it last week and the week before. So um, Sunday school starts at 1030. No registration is needed for Sunday school, but you still need to register for worship service. The worship service is at 9 o'clock. Um, we, uh, the, the registration, as I said, is still required for that. We have been filling the room up the last couple of weeks. So um, there's an overflow room. We'll not turn anyone away uh, with a big screen and sound in there. Uh, if you, if you want to be sure you get a seat in the main sanctuary, uh, please uh, get on the list and your seat will be reserved. If you show up early and you're, uh, if you show up and you're not, do not have a reservation. You will be uh, in the overflow room at least until the worship service starts. And then if there are any seats left, you'll be moved from there into the main worship service. So play it on the safe side. Sign up. Get your name in. Number of seats. FBCLB.com is where you can do that. FBCLB.com. Uh, get on the list and we'll save a seat for you. So hope to see you Sunday morning uh, for worship service. And for church, Easter Sunday morning, two worship services, no Sunday school. Go to the website, again, fbclb.com. Catch the times on those. I believe they're 8.30 and 10.30. Not certain on that? Check it out. Be sure. Okay. So, um, today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 17. Um, let's pray, and we'll get started on that, shall we? Uh, join me, please. Father, thank you for uh, our time together. We're here this morning, uh, um, Lord, to, to worship you, to, to offer our praises, and to, and to offer ourselves to you, Lord, to, to mold by the study of your word. So I pray that that's what will happen. I pray that you would lead us into the truth today. Keep us from error as we, uh, as we study your word, Lord. Help us to see in it what you want us to see in it and to, and to apply it to our lives when we're done. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Luke, chapter 18, verse 9. Um, I'm going um, to read verse 9 only just to get started, and we'll talk about that, and then we'll take this a little piece at a time, shall we? Okay, verse 9 says, He, he being Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. To those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Well, who was in the audience? Who was there in this group of people that Jesus was talking to? Um, there were Pharisees were there. Some of these people who uh, thought that they were righteous, they trusted in themselves, were Pharisees. Uh, some were people who were not Pharisees but trusted that they had been good that they had done what they were supposed to do, that they had, had to the best of their ability, done, treated people right. Um, you may know people like this uh, that, that believe that uh, the way to salvation is be good enough. Um, and if you read the Bible, that is a totally inaccurate interpretation of it. So... Um, the, the audience included, again, those people who thought they were good enough, people who knew that they weren't good enough, and people who just came to listen who really didn't know where they stood. And that pretty well describes the people that we come in contact with every day. Um, we'll find people who think that they've done well and that that's good enough to get them in heaven. That's the determining factor. We find people who know that they haven't done well, and know that that is not the determining factor. And we know people who just don't understand how salvation is attained. So 
there's everybody in that group, there's probably everybody in this group um, watching this video. So, there's something to be learned here. These people, to, he told this parable to, parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. What does that mean? What were they trusting for? They trusted in themselves. There must have been something in it for them. What was it? They believed that they were righteous enough for salvation. I'm good enough. Now, that's that first group that we talked about a minute ago. Um, what do these people look like? Well, they're socially acceptable. People like them. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're, um, they're probably financially secure. They've done well financially. Um, the, the people that, uh, the Pharisee, uh, Pharisees, a lot of these people here were religious people. So they thought that their religion was going to be the determining factor about whether they had salvation or not. How often they went to church, how much money they gave. Um, they, they kept away from the unclean people and they, they kept all the laws, the little laws. Um, Pharisees had a, a book of laws uh, in addition to the laws of God. Um, and, and they did their best to keep all of these. And they said, well, that's what we're, we're with that. Hey, I'm good enough. I'm good enough. Again, today, translate that to today. And we know people that kind of fit into that mold a little bit, don't we? Um, they, they, but it says here um, in the last part of verse 9, and they treated others with contempt. Now we're talking about haughty people, proud people. They looked down on the people who weren't quite as righteous or wealthy or religious as they were. So um, that's a trap. Uh, that's a trap. The, the, um, the King James Version says they despised other people. Um, how, how did they do that? They ridiculed them. They, they, they mocked them. They, oh, look at that guy. Look at that clothes he's got on. He's not nearly as clean as I am uh, or righteous as I am. And again, this is a trap that we have to beware of falling into. Just because someone doesn't look like you or dress like you or even smell like you doesn't mean that they are less righteous than you. Uh, doesn't mean that God loves them any less than he loves you. They, uh, they mock, they scorn, sarcasm, remember Jesus on the cross? They mocked even Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, so, uh, what does, they, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They justified themselves in their own eyes they were good enough. So um, it's hard to judge ourselves, isn't it? Well, we're good at judging other people, but turn that around and judge me? I usually don't get that one right. So um, in verses 10 through 12, let me read those. Um, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now remember, the Pharisees were the religious experts. Um, the Pharisee, verse 11, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. Um, so, so here's, the, the, again, the religious um, leader in the community and in the temple, uh, and and. and these words sound good. God, I thank you. He started out well. Um, Self-righteousness can be disguised as, uh, as gratitude. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that person over there. I mean, I can look at him and tell that he's, you don't love him as much as you love me, and I thank you that, that I'm not like him. That's nothing but self-righteousness himself. Now, um, the tax collector, 
on the other hand. We'll get to him in a minute. Uh, but about tax collectors, the Pharisee, religious leader, high standing in the community, the tax collector uh, basically extorted money from the people in the community. They didn't like him at all. So you got one guy who's looked up to, one guy that's looked down upon, and he and the Pharisee picks out this tax collector, the man who's hated in the community and treated as a traitor by the Jews, and points him out in his prayer. Now God knew who was there. God knew his situation and his situation as well. Why was he doing this? He prayed. Uh, uh, two men went up into the temple to pray. The Pharisee, standing by himself, it says in 11, prayed aloud. Uh, I'm, uh, God, I thank you. I'm not like other men. Extortioners. Well, no, one, no one wants to be like an extortioner. Um, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Now, again, this is his view of himself. It says in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. What does it mean when he says, Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full? This is Jesus speaking in Matthew 6, 5 and 6. What does it mean when he says they've received their reward in full. Their reward is being seen in public. That's what they do it for. That's, that's all they're going to get out of it. Their prayers um, fall on deaf ears, if you will. He congratulated himself about not being like these. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Um, he used... Uh, Notice, if you go back and count them, there are five times in that passage of Scripture that he used the word I. Now, the Pharisee's prayer was all about, he, he had an I problem, right? It was all about him. Look at that. I this, I that. Um, he continues, or no, in verse 13, um, the tax collector standing far off, could not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breasts, saying, uh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, the, the, he was ashamed. He couldn't even look up to heaven. He was so ashamed of his own sin. Compare that to the Pharisee. The Pharisee gave no thanks to God. He, he no praise. He made no petition. His prayer was all about himself, wasn't it? Look how good I am, God. I'm not like this guy. Look at me. I'm so good. Gosh, God, you're lucky to have a guy like me. Well, God got along without you just a long, for a long, long time, Mr. Pharisee. So uh, the, the, the tax collector was, is just the flip side of this coin. Um, he... Uh, he was, he was so humble that, well, in Luke 23, 48, it says this is at the crucifixion. This is the grief that the people had the, at the crucifixion and how they showed it in this society, in this era, in this context. He beat his breast, it said. It says in Luke 23, 48, and all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, the crucifixion of Christ, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. He was sad. He asked God, asking, he asked for mercy. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He knew his problem. The Pharisee thought that, that he, was, he was good enough and, and that he was so glad that he wasn't like this poor man over here and the poor man over here came in honesty and humility to God and said, I need help. I'm in a situation I can't fix. What did he offer to God? Nothing. What did he have to offer to God? Nothing. Um, so these two guys are similar. 
in a few ways. They were both at the temple, right? They were both there. They both knew the need for atonement. Um, the Pharisee thought he had earned the right to be forgiven by his good works. He had done many good things. I'm sure he had done good things in the community. He was honestly trying to live the right life. And he thought that, as I just said, he had earned the right to be forgiven. Well, um, the tax collector knew that there was no way that he could please God. His sin was keeping him from that, but he was repentant. He knew that he was guilty, and he understood his own sinfulness. He had nothing to bargain with. He didn't come to make a bargain with God. He didn't come to tell God how good he was and how much he had done. He came to God knowing that he had nothing to, to justify him or to make him worthy of God's mercy. So that's the big difference in the two. Uh, it's a, in 14, verse 14, Jesus said, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exhausts, exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. I tell you, Jesus said. Authority. That's a statement of authority. I'm telling you now, this is the way it is. That's what Jesus said. This man went to his house justified immediately. What else did he have to do? Nothing. Surrender himself to Christ just like us. We surrender ourselves to Christ. We are justified. What does justified mean? It's a legal term. It means pronounced not guilty. Just unjust. That's the that's where this came from. He what he was unjust. He had done wrong things, but he was pronounced by God to be just. So God says positionally, you are sinless in my sight. The same thing he says to you and me. When we surrender ourselves to him and when we come to him honestly and openly and in humility and say, God, I can't undo what I've done. What's done is done. Only you can take away that burden of my sin and that separation from you that sin places there. So um, the, the, the high and mighty, he says, everyone who exalts himself will be humble. The high and mighty will be brought low. The meek will inherit the earth. That's in one of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. The Pharisees, certainly, the Pharisees in this crowd, let's get back to the situation at hand here, this crowd of people, the Pharisees did not want to hear this because they were the um, everyone who exalts himself. That was them. He was speaking directly to them with authority, I tell you. And they had seen him and heard him before. And the, um, they did. This was not something that tickled their ears. So... Um, and what he was saying was this. Uh, the one who humbles himself will be exalted um, in the kingdom. He was saying this. Unless and until you understand the principle that salvation is by faith alone and not by works, you, you cannot be saved. You just don't understand the facts of the matter as explained in Scripture. Not, I'm not making this up. I'm, here it is, right here, as explained in Scripture. So, in verses 15 through 18, I mean 15 through 17, pardon me, it says this. Now, they were bringing even infants to him that, that he might touch them, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God, truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Does this mean that uh, you take your children to church and have them baptized, uh, that um, they are now uh, heaven bound? It does not. What does it mean? They're bringing infants to him that he might touch them. Um, even 
infants, it says in the uh, English Standard um, Version. Isaiah 44, 3 says this, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing upon your descendants. Now, if you have found something as good as faith in Christ and a renewed relationship with God through his mercy and his forgiveness, you would want to share that with your children, would you not? Um, these people were, they had seen Jesus, they knew, they realized who he was, they realized that through him comes salvation. They brought their children to him um, simply for that reason. They loved their children, they loved Jesus. They wanted them there as well. Why did his disciples rebuke him? Um, can you imagine the, <laughs> Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? They did. Um, they thought it was, there were a lot of people there in the crowd and they thought it, would, it was crowd control for them. They thought Jesus would be um, overcome by the crowd, rushing in with all their kids to, to receive a, a, a touch from him. It says in verse 16, But Jesus called to them, saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such, key word there, to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. What did he mean when he said to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven? What, 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 did the chil what about children? Um, truly I say to you, verse 17, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. What is he talking about here? What about a child? A child comes freely. A child is helpless. A child knows that he needs help. A child will find his mother or his father when he needs help. A child is trusting. A child, does not, a child knows no fear. We have to teach them that. A child will stick a spoon in a light socket because they don't know any fear. They have no reservations. If we come to Jesus Christ trusting, no reservations, nothing held back, totally dependent, uh, a child has no achievements like the Pharisee did, right? A child cannot come and say, look what I've done. They haven't, these are infants. Uh, the child comes um, with natural honesty and natural humility and nothing to brag about and nothing to justify themselves. Jesus says that's how people need to come to me by faith alone with don't bring anything to just to try to justify yourself that you are worthy to be allowed into the kingdom. That is not it. Again, sola fide, faith alone is the key. So um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, a verse you may or may not be familiar with. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, and this is the whole thing. Um, the point of this parable or uh, these two, uh, the parable and the story that follows it, um, I believe is this. For grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You understand, if we could work our way in, it would be the biggest bragging contest in heaven, uh, and people fighting over the front seats if there are front seats in heaven. But there, um, Christianity is, it's been said, the, the, uh, the ground is level at the foot of, cro at the, foot of the cross. Uh, don't try to work your way into heaven. Go back and read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Don't be a one-verse theologian or two verses in this case. Read it, understand it. Read all the verses around it. Find out about salvation and how don't take my word for it, research it. Use the Bible and research it and find out how Jesus Christ said is the one and only way to come through to him through faith and not through works. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for our time together. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your grace. Um, 
Uh, thank you for the fact that we understand that we can come to you humbly and needing nothing and offering nothing and just nothing but ourselves. And, uh, and when we surrender ourselves to you in humility and in repentance, we know that you will shed your grace upon us, Lord. And we thank you for that more than anything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.